Hey everybody, what's up? This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and today I'm going to be talking about the Monoprice Monolith THX365 Center Channel. That's a mouthful. This speaker runs about 500 bucks. It's, I think it's actually 499 on the website direct from Monoprice. Occasionally goes on sale, and as of today, it's actually on sale for $449 and then plus shipping, whatever that costs. In the realm of center channels, if you've watched my previous discussion about the issue with most center channels, I'll put it up here if you haven't seen it. Uh, typically what you find is speakers or center channels in general are just not that good, especially the budget ones, and especially if you want them to get any kind of loud without distortion. This particular center channel actually seems to buck that trend to some degree, and while it's not perfect, I think that it might be the best center channel available at this price range. Now, keep in mind, I haven't tested everything that's out there, but looking at what I have tested in this price bracket and comparing it to other tests that I have seen in this price bracket, I feel pretty confident saying that it's the best one that makes the least compromises. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you. We will go through this data. I'll show you some of the caveats, some of the trade-offs, and then some of the good areas where this particular center channel shines and why it may be a good option for you. This speaker has two six and a half inch woofers on either side. It features a two inch silk dome mid-range and a one inch silk dome tweeter. The rated sensitivity is at about 89.5 dB, which actually checks out with my data. This is a sealed enclosure and it weighs about 26 pounds. Now, the one thing I do like about this speaker is it has a nice like felt type material on the bottom to keep it from getting scratched up. The binding plates on the back are of nice quality. And overall, I would just say that the build quality of the speaker seems to be pretty good, especially for the price that it costs. For the most part, I like the speaker. I can tell you that as a center channel, almost every one of them have issues, right? But this one seems to have the least amount of issues in regards to linearity and output. Now, it's not perfectly flat on axis. It does have some linearity shifts as you go further off axis. And there is some compression that stood out to me. But for the most part, I think, like I said earlier, it does the best job of mitigating its compromises all while costing under $500. You know, honestly, I really didn't really have any complaints about this particular speaker other than when I sat off to the side, the mid range and everything sounded pretty much the same as it does directly on axis. So if you're talking about having the same sound characteristics, if you are the primary listener, or if you are the side listener or even a back row listener, for the most part, you're gonna be okay. But what I did notice was that the treble tends to drop off above about five kilohertz or so, and it starts to narrow up. So it doesn't quite sound the same. That may or may not be an issue to you or your listeners, but it is the one thing that I will caveat about this data in regards to its off axis sound quality. Now, having said that, nearly all of the speakers that I've tested of center channels, at least like the standard types in this price range, suffer a lot worse issues and it's almost always in the mid-range area. Personally speaking, I would rather have this issue come up in the upper regions of the treble than the mid-range where the dialogue is. All the data we're about to go through is gathered using my Clipple Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows you to get pure anechoic data in a non anechoic room such as my garage, like you see in this video. This is great because it allows you to characterize the performance of the speaker without having to worry about the effects of the room, and that works well to translate to other rooms. So you can take this data, you can generate an estimated in-room response, and above about 500 hertz or so, you can pretty well and accurately determine and predict the estimated in-room response for your room. So if you were to measure with the RTA in your room, you would be within a couple dB of the estimated in-room response. And we're gonna show that in a little bit. To start things off, we're gonna look at the CEA 2034 data, which we have here. The black line represents the on-axis response. And you can see there's a dip right around the one kilohertz area, which is kind of interesting. You can also see that the listening window response actually looks pretty good until you get to the upper treble region where there's another minor dip right through there. 
And if we go down to the early reflections directivity index, it actually looks pretty good. All this area right through here should be equalizable. And then you've got a dip right through here that is gonna be less equalizable. And that just basically means that if there's a sound that you don't necessarily like in here, well, you can correct it for one primary seat, but it's not gonna to translate to the other seats as well. But once you get out of this little dip region right here and start to increase up, now you become equalizable again. Now that's important to remember about a speaker that's gonna be used in a home theater, like a center channel, because most home theater setups do have equalization available either through the AVR or external like a mini DSP. Some of the highlights I wanna hit from the previous graphic is my measured sensitivity from 300 to three kilohertz is about 88.6 dB. The linearity of the speaker is pretty darn good. On axis and even through the listening window, it's within plus or minus three dB. And actually through the listening window, it's even a little bit better, so that's good. The F3 is at 81 hertz down here. F10 is at 54 hertz. This is a sealed enclosure. The F3 being at 81 hertz means that you're gonna to want to use a subwoofer for this speaker. This is the estimated in-room response. And I drew a little line through here to kind of give you an idea of the trend that this speaker exhibits in the estimation of the in-room response. And it actually looks pretty good. You can see there's a couple little areas that stand out. Uh, the mid-range is about one dB or so below the estimated trend line. You've got about a half a dB over here in the one to one and a half kilohertz area. And you've got another bump right around here in the three kilohertz area. For the most part, what this means is the vocals may sound a little bit, a little bit subdued compared to the rest of the frequency range. But I think it's so minor that I wouldn't really worry about it too much. Plus with this being in the Schroeder frequency area where the room is more dominant of the sound, you're gonna wind up having to equalize this stuff anyway. So I wouldn't sweat this too much. It is a good way to get an idea of how the speaker is going to sound, relatively speaking though. And with that said, this is really a pretty darn good estimated in-room response. This is the SPL horizontal. So as you move on axis to the side of the speaker out to 90 degrees, and what I wanna show here is just the dip in response. Now this is due to the distance between the two mid bass on the sides of the speakers. And as I said, I discussed this all in a separate video, which I've already linked to. I'll make sure to link it in the description below as well. But you can see what this means is that the sound power is decreasing as you go off axis. But then right through here where the mid range is kind of picking back up, you can see that it's increasing. Now the thing that stands out to me is the off axis sound is actually higher than the on axis sound from about one kilohertz to about one and a half kilohertz. Well, my guess is that is likely baffle diffraction. And the reason I say that is because there's no internal resonances or anything of that nature that stand out in the speaker in any of the other data. So that makes me think that it's some kind of baffle diffraction where the edges of the speaker are radiating a little bit more in level than the on-axis response. And really this could just be an on-axis response issue, but I will say I find this quite interesting. I don't think I've seen a case where even out to 50 degrees and 60 degrees, you have the energy being way above the on-axis response. And uh, if the designer of this speaker happens to see this and has some information for me, hey man, I welcome the opportunity to learn and share that with my audience as well. Now we're gonna look at the horizontal polar response. Now this will be a bird's eye view of the response. What I wanna point out here is the area where I discussed a minute ago where you have higher level of energy off to the side compared to the direct on axis response. Again, I think this is probably baffle diffraction. Now let's walk through the radiation pattern of this speaker. In the mid range from about 200 Hertz to about 500 Hertz or so, you can see that the response radiation pattern is about plus or minus 50 degrees. And then as you go from the mid range at about 500 Hertz to about five kilohertz, you actually increase in width and radiation to about plus or minus 80 degrees. Whereas most speakers like this are much more narrow through here. So while it's not even, I think that I would take this if you're listening in a home theater type setup where you're gonna have people sitting off to the side. And then this shows the narrowing of the tweeter pattern. Now this is the vertical polar response. And we can see that it's even within about plus or minus 25 degrees, which is great. That means if you don't have the ability to set the speaker up directly at ear level with the tweeter lined up with your ear, then you can set it below you a little bit and you're probably gonna be just fine. 
Also, if you have people sitting behind you in a second row and they're sitting up high, this is going to work well for them as well. This is the distortion for this speaker at 86 dB at one meter. Normally, I only have the black line to show where the 3% distortion is because most speakers start to go over that limit, even at 86 dB on the lower end. But this speaker doesn't really even hit the 1% distortion limit until 60 or 50 hertz. That's just really good. We go to 96 dB, we can see that the speaker is pretty much within that 1% distortion limit, even down to about 90 hertz here. And again, that's quite good. Now we're going to look at the compression, and this is the one measurement that really kind of befuddled me. And up until this point, I was thinking, dang, this speaker looks pretty dang awesome. But in terms of objective performance, this is the one aspect that stood out to me and made me scratch my head. I actually retested the speaker and took it apart to make sure there were no resonances in it, because normally when I see a peak through here, it's either distortion or it's a resonance. And in this case, I'm going to say it's likely distortion. And then on the lower end, it's going to be likely tweeter compression as well. But, you know, are you going to hear this? I think this is going to vary. The cue of this is so narrow that I'm not confident that anybody's going to notice this issue. And it doesn't really start to become problematic until, well, I'll say it probably would not be problematic until you're at the higher output levels of, of 102 dB, where you're so high at that point that I don't know if you're, even your hearing is linear enough to notice the difference between that and 76 dB. So this, this one's really tough for me to, to say for sure, are you gonna hear it? Are you not gonna hear it? I trust the data, I verified the data. So I went and specifically listened to this and I actually used test tones, which I don't advise listening to test tones at higher level, but I was curious to see if I would notice it. And honestly, I didn't. Now, I'm not saying that nobody else will, but I'm just saying that I think because it's such a narrow cue and it's so loud that it's just not something that registered immediately to me and was like, hey, dude, I'm a problem. Um, if it were lower it down here, maybe, and it were over an octave or two, then I think I would probably notice it. I certainly feel more confident that I would notice it as opposed to this right here. But I just want to be honest with you. This is the data. This is what the data shows. But I can't say 100% that it's going to be a problem. It bothers me that I see it in the data, but at the end of the day, I'm going to leave it to you to make the determination if it's offensive to you or problematic to you. And that's it for the objective and the subjective. Um, I'll just say once again that the speaker giving all the things that it is intended to do, you need a center channel that has wide dispersion pattern, this speaker does that. Is it linear in its dispersion? Meaning, does it behave the exact same way? Off axis? No, we talked about that. Through the mid-range up to about 500 hertz, it's about plus or minus 50 degrees. Then it widens up. And then at five kilohertz, it starts to narrow up again. Now, that's not ideal. But for a center channel, I'm okay with this trade-off. Output-wise, the distortion is very, very, very low. The compression is the only thing that makes me scratch my head, and I'm I'm just going to leave that up to you guys. But I will say that all in all, looking at the data, based on what I heard in my listening evaluation, I think for the price that it's at of just squeaking in under 500 bucks, that it's probably, I, won't, I don't know for sure if it's the best, but it's probably one of the best budget center channel options out there, and I would encourage you that if you're on the fence about getting this or maybe something else, buy this one, give it a shot while you're also trying out the other one and see what you like. And if you do want to buy the speaker, I will have an affiliate link below. Now that has nothing to do with the data. The data is what the data is and it's not biased by me having an affiliate link. So if you don't want to buy the speaker, just don't use my affiliate link. But if you appreciate the data that you've seen and you appreciate the effort that I put in this review, then if you do want to buy the speaker, using the affiliate link will help. I actually got the speaker from an owner. So Monoprice did not send me the speaker. I'm not paid for this review or any of that crazy stuff. This is just straight up data from a speaker that I was loaned to review. All of that said, another way you can support is patreon.com. Check the description below. I'm not going to go on about that. I do appreciate you watching. If you have any questions, please be sure to ask. All this data is on my website, aaronsaudiocorner.com. Just look for it. You'll find it. And I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.